define uh, how you use AR technology in new kind of experiences to avoid a lot of the limitations. Uh, and the company name is Deco. Please welcome Matt Meithnix. Okay. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit quickly who Deco is um, and really get into some of the problems that we've been trying to solve and some of the solutions that we, we think we found and in particular a lot of the stuff that we've learned. Um, like Ori said, we, we have a slightly, I guess, you know, different view of, of AR and the way it should be approached from a user experience design point of view. And uh, uh, yeah, love to share a little bit about it. But in terms of who we are, we're a startup. We're based in Soma. Uh, we're about five people. Um, been going for a couple of years, and we build both our own core technology from the ground up, which I'll go into in a little bit of detail. But we also build the applications that run on top of that technology. Uh, one thing that we've really learned is that. Um, building just the technology or just the applications, you end up with you know, uh, not the best experience for an end user. And you know, one of our uh, you know, founding values as a company, and, and definitely our whole team shares, is that we want to start with the end user experience and something that hopefully will engage a user and, and get them to start using you know, this type of experience is uh, a regular part of their lives, and then how do you back from there into ultimately the technology solution at the end of the day? So, um, and I guess lastly, we're partners, uh, not so much like this, but hopefully more like this. And we are launching um, uh, our first game uh, toward, at the end of this week, and we're starting to want to uh, talk with partners you know, in some more detail from now on. So, what you know, most of the AR around today, uh, we, you know, it's mostly a, a 2D world. It's mostly based on you know, recognizing something that you've pre-trained the system to recognize. Um, we think about it as being you know, physical first. You start with a physical object, and then you add something digital on top of it. And uh, I don't know if folks remember, but a couple of years ago, there was a bit of debate in you know, mobile app development and whether a, a company should be you know, web first or mobile first. You know, do you, are you eBay and you try and squeeze that down onto a mobile app or are you Instagram and you start with a mobile app you know, at the beginning? And I think AR um, you know, is a similar sort of crossroads where most things up to today have been you know, physical first. And if that physical object isn't there, you know, the app just doesn't work. You can't, can't use it. But to make it a part of everyday life, it really needs to be you know, digital first. So uh, this is a screenshot of our, our game that's coming out. Um, I'll show you a demo of that later. But it's, it's really based on um, being able to use the app, whatever the app is. It should be able to work just about anywhere. So we, we digital first. And we really try to think about or not be afraid of the technology, you know, some really hard technology that needed to be built, um, you know, things like SLAM, which we talk about. and trying to um, make it real time, make it everything that goes on needs to be able to run in the background and still leave headroom on the device for great graphics. Um, so we, we've built our own 3D tracking system. It doesn't just work on a plane, but it will track in you know, anything on 3D objects, on walls, ceiling. We're doing 3D reconstruction in real time at the same time. So uh, this little, you know, Screenshot is a little um, hack that we're, we're playing around with at the moment that lets you, you know, as you as you move your device around, give you a real-time sort of voxelized Minecraft-style pixelized 8-bit video you know, view of the world. Uh, we're pulling you know, color data out, and we're we're sort of building Pierre in you know in a in a low-resolution you know, view. Obviously, we want to run 3D graphics on top of it. So a you know, big theme of our technology is, is real time and 3D. The last bit that we've already got running now is, um, which I'm happy to demo to you, is uh, a multi-user or a multiplayer experience. This is where two people or many people, we don't, I don't think we even know what the upper limit is yet, but we've, we've run it on like five or six devices so far, 
can all look at the same experience. So if I'm playing with my car, for instance, in front of me, and you want to come along and stand beside me, you can also see that um, happening at the same time. So where does all this you know, big tech um, kind of end up? Uh, and this is where I really want to get into the, I think what's the interesting part of this conversation is, it, is for us it, it leads towards tabletop gaming. We are realising that when you start you know, cluing into you know, augmented reality and this whole domain, it gets really easy to, to think big and to imagine the, you know, the world changing potential and to you know, talk to science fiction authors and see how it's, it's a different universe we're going to be in soon. But when we try and think about today, it's, it's think small, you know, think smaller, think smaller. And we have found at DECO that almost every you know, three or four months we sort of get together as a team and we actually have to reduce, reduce, reduce what we're trying to achieve um, to get closer to something that is going to meet an end user's you know, needs or expectations or, or wants. So for us, although these technologies let us build the world in real time and we get ideas about playing Frogger on freeways or Donkey Kong down the streets, uh, today it means about a 10 foot by 10 foot space, which is a tabletop. It means uh, paying attention to the form factor of the hardware, which today means a, a smartphone or a tablet. And if you want a user to do anything more than hold their phone or tablet like this, um, that behaviour change is not going to be possible. People you know, don't want to do the hands-up display. So when you combine the hardware capacity that's there, where the software's at, the fact that people want to sit you know, holding their device like this, kind of naturally leads you towards a, a tabletop scale experience and then you think what type of tabletop experiences are going to work and be attractive to people and we ended up here with, uh, with gaming. So what sort of problems do we, you know, do we have to work on? We've, you know, we had the tech, the core tech working a bit over a year ago and we spent the last year hammering out these UX problems. Uh, the biggest one is a vocabulary. There's lots of specialised terms that are unfamiliar to users. You need to explain them to them without using words at all. You know, they don't want to read. So one thing is, what's a good scene? If they put the camera against a whiteboard or on a white desk, the camera can't see anything, it's not going to work. So a user doesn't know what a good scene is. They think, they don't know if that's a good scene, they don't know if that's a good scene or if that's a good scene. So how do you explain that to them? What sort of techniques do you use? To get a reconstruction in 3D from a single camera, you need to get different views of the good scene. So what's motion? What's good motion? How do you explain terms like translate, rotate? Um, how do you explain fast motion, slow motion, jerky motion, when no other application you know, needs you to move at all? What sort of visual cues make sense to a user? Here, I don't know if the grid lines are coming up very well, but you know, our ability to reconstruct that scene happens, can happen in the background while the game's running, but we learnt that just confused people. We needed to break things down so they only had to think about one thing at a time. And here, so we broke out this scanning phase and we dropped these grid lines over the top of the world to give people a cue that something's happening in 3D. We turn off the grid lines where there's nothing to see. We make them yellow where the quality isn't that good to give them a little cue to do a little bit more looking at that space. And then when they lose tracking, you, you can't use the word tracking, you can't use the word recovery, you can't use any of those sort of technical terms, but we found by changing it to red and letting that grid move, it gives them a cue to move back to where they were. So these, these are the sort of problems that are really, you know, taken up a ton of our time and, and um, are where we think we're, that we've come up with some solutions that are going to help you know, with, uh, with good design. When you're starting to think about experience design or game design, there's sorts of problems, again, that no one's ever thought of. How do you um, communicate to someone that this object is in the world? What metaphor do you use? We, we started out using a little, a little monkey that would come on your desk and loved it. It was a fantastic character. People connected to it. But after they'd gone through all these steps of trying to learn, gee, it's in the 3D world, and how do, what does this reconstruction mean? Then they'd still go, why is there a monkey on my desk? So using a switching to a car let us have a metaphor that people already understood. They'll hold the controls in their hand, they'd drive the, the car on their, on their table. That was something that didn't need explaining. So it was a conscious choice. Um, how do you design gameplay where you have no control over the level or where the camera is going to be? What sort of control system do you use? And I'll show a little bit what we're doing. So with that, you know, a bunch of these design problems, um, we 
really thought about how do we, or should we, partner with people? Should we release an SDK? And we initially thought yes about a year ago because we thought there's too many good ideas for one company. But we just came to the view that where that is going to end up with lots and lots of shallow applications, where really we only wanted a handful of really deep, high quality applications. So we're not doing an SDK yet, but we do want to find partners that we can work really, really closely with on some of these design problems. So if you're thinking about being a, you know, curious about what we're doing, you want to know, are we going to be a, a good partner? Could we work together? Could you have an idea or a use case for Deco's technology? Think about you know, these three things. Um, does your idea fit in a tabletop area? Does it need the 3D world, or will it just work fine on a, on a flat space? Um, is it, um, and do you have the, I guess, the, the production ability, you know, capability to build something in 3D yourself with the, you know, the Unity, the animation, and, and modeling skills? And so here's a, a quick little demo of the game in action. Here, the two, um, oops. You'll see the car, you do a little swipe on the screen and you'll see the car do a jump over a little ramp there. We've done the modeling. You know, this is all just a real-time capture. It gets hidden behind the box. Um, the control system here in this case is just a swipe. We've got another one with the RC controls. We, you know, someone asked a question earlier about control systems. We tried four or five different you know, systems that to find something that would make sense to people at different levels of, of ability. Um, and this one you know, worked nicely. So that's kind of what the game looks like, what it feels like, and it's going to be launched on Thursday, you know, this week, Thursday, Friday, and uh, here's how to contact us. So thanks, I'd love to take questions. Uh, if you want to find me after, we can talk about the technology for as long as you want, um, particularly the intersection of the apps and the technology is, is something we've, you know, we're really interested in. So thank you. Questions for Matt? Okay, I have one. Yeah. yeah. So, Matt, wh when do you think this uh, type of technology will allow us to play on a larger scale, you know, on a street or a yeah. field? Um, good question. We, so, we, we've kind of sitting at that room side. I mean, our, I guess our hope is in terms of our roadmap where I would say sidewalk scale gameplay, you know, city block size, um, definitely within 12 months, um, hopefully a fair bit sooner than that. Um, that's to get the technology working. I think that once you go outdoors, you kind of need to rethink the gameplay and, you know, if, if the hardware that you're expecting to run it on needs people to hold their phone up in front of their face, it's probably a bad game. Um, so although you can do sort of the outdoor, this sort of thing outdoor, it might not be a good idea, so... Do yeah. you think it's the same type of technology that can apply both to small spaces as well as large spaces? Yeah, or yeah. it might be a different... No, it'll be, it'll be roughly the same technology. The, um, the, I mean, our roadmap is really to take that, expand in a few ways, to take the 10-foot um, you know, by 10-foot area and, and make that bigger, to take the resolution of the reconstruction from right now, it's about an inch you know, cubes, take that down to pixel quality, and to take the multiplayer to support more and more users with, with more and more advanced capabilities there. So. One last question for Matt. Anybody? Uh, yeah. Yeah, your focus is on gaming. And, uh, is, that, is that your focus? And do you, play, do you actually develop the game yourself and try and publish it? Or are you going to work with uh, other publishers to develop the game for them? Yeah, right now we think gaming. Uh, the question was, um, are we a game company? Um, are we going to build games ourselves or are we going to work with third parties? Um, we think the gaming, or specifically tabletop gaming, is the right, um, you know, the time is right. The technology works. We've built our own game to you know, prove it to ourselves. So for now, gaming is, is what we're doing in terms of applications. We are going to continue to build some games ourselves, but there's, there's too many good ideas for one company. So we want to find those first partners to build the first games, you know, whether it's a Marble Madness or a Lemmings or a Tower Defense or pinball games, something. There's lots of good tabletop ideas that could work. 
So we're definitely going to work with partners, um, but we're going to keep learning by building games ourselves as well. As the tech roadmap goes on, that's going to crack open more and more verticals will become viable. Um, so gaming's not the be all and end all, but it's, it's definitely what we're focused on for the you know, immediate future. Okay, thanks very much. Right. Thanks.